This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, and Huskers Radio Network Analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Well, we also took a bye week ourselves, but we are back with another edition of the Sideline Slice heading into the Huskers final game of a four game homestand against Indiana with Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cootie, and I guess first and foremost, right off the top, we can't bury the lead. You went hunting, you were off the grid for like two weeks, but you did not come back with an elk, right? Personally, I did not come back with an elk. <laughs> no, my, my buddy shot an elk. My dad shot a bear. We saw moose, we saw mountain lions, we saw mule deer. It was a ton of fun. But the bigger thing, I leave for 10 days and I come back and Nebraska is entirely different. There's new coaches, there's old coaches gone. And I was just like, I remember I called you at one point and you're like, we have so much to talk about. Yes. So apparently there's been a lot of changes and I'm just getting caught up with them as we speak. All right, before we dive into that, I mean, what do you do with a bear when you shoot a bear? You um, stuff you know, it? You, no, well, so you make a rug. You know, my oh. buddy's going to make a nice bear skin rug out of it. You make the meat you really just make in a sausage. Bear steaks aren't necessarily very good. Uh huh. You know, but bear sausage is pretty good. So we'll get some bear sausage made. Um, and the back straps will turn into steaks. And then what about Oliver? I mean, and not getting elk to eat. Are, you, are they going to share some of it? Yes. It was a group effort. It was a group effort. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll get some elk to share. Um, everyone will get some of that, and Oliver will be satisfied, I promise. And you know what? It's October now, soon, which means I'll be able to go hunt deer. So now the deer season gets rolling, and, you know, hunting season's really just getting started, Jessica. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right. Well, uh, yeah, you mentioned it. Uh, a lot of has unfolded over the last couple of weeks. I mean, we even had to record an emergency podcast when you were on the road. And so, yeah, um, I think, though, Overall, bye week coming at the perfect time. Most of the time, I know players don't like to have a bye week coming off a loss, but I think the bye week came at a very much needed time for this program. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone needed a breath of fresh air. I mean, from the fans to Mickey Joseph as the new head coach to the players. I mean, there was just so much being built up and going on here over the last four weeks that everyone needed a fresh reset, you know? And so this was a really good time for that all to come in have one to be able to refocus and also it gave Mickey Joseph and, and staff time to kind of reset the structure of maybe how they want to do things right you talk about hey new head coach maybe that's a new practice schedule maybe that's a new way that the scripts are put together or you know just a bunch of different things it gave them a couple of weeks to really get on top of that so that when the kids showed back up this week ready to roll everything isn't just kind of all over the place that hopefully they have a nice structured plan put together. Well, um, Eric Schnander is uh, no longer the defensive coordinator. Trev Albert said he's going to give uh, you know full reign to Mickey Joseph to make whatever decisions he felt was necessary for this program. I know you were very, very close with Coach Schnander, thought the world of him. He was great to me, too. Obviously, just a, a nice, nice, nice human being. His players loved him. But, um, you know, as, as was said by Mickey Joseph, it just um, things weren't working this year. And so he felt that a change was going to be needed headed into this bye week. Yeah, you know, that one, it surprised me because we thought, and you and I both thought, the defense was going to be a big strength going into this season, you mm -hmm. know? We've had guys returning in key positions, and in the back of our heads, we all kind of thought, you know, we lost a lot last year, but there's, there's a lot of guys to make up for that. And I think that's something where we overestimated maybe how much experience those guys just didn't have. I mean, you really look at it of who we lost, You're talking Ben Stilley, JoJo Doman, Daniels, like the list goes on of main big contributors last year to where now it's a bunch of guys that in years past, we've had games that we've been blowing guys out. So these young players have gotten in early games to get development. Well, when you lose as many one score games as Coach Frost and the team lost last year, the fifth year seniors are battling that thing through all the way to the end. So you're not getting the young players that they're developing. So I think that played a key role into maybe why the defense wasn't clicking right away. And yeah, I was honestly, I'm really sad to see chins go, you know, seeing chins go is something that was tough for me when I saw that man, my heart really broke because I know how much he poured into these kids and how much he loved this program. But Mickey Joseph is right. You know, there's a standard that is set. Every football coach knows it. Every fan knows it. Every player knows that there's a standard that is set, which is win. And when things are going well, you have to make changes. You can't have the definition of insanity, you know, just doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. So I respect the move by Mickey Joseph to go in a different direction. But, you know, I think that this is one of those things, too, that when you look at it, we're not going to be able to fix this football team in season. 
football teams don't get fixed in the months of September and October. They get fixed in January, February. Not to say the changes can't be made, you know, but I don't. I hope the fans and everyone realize just because we made these changes and let Scott go and let Chins go doesn't mean all of a sudden that there's just going to be some light switch that turns on and we're going to start winning football games by 40. That's just not how this works. So being that you don't make a lot of significant fixes and changes in a week and a bye week, but what do you think this team, I know you never went through this, but what do you think this team wanted to accomplish over the last week and then this week heading into Indiana? You know, I think the number one thing that this team looked at was not necessarily on the field, but more of off the field of playing for a little bit more of freedom. You know, I think that everyone felt the looming weight of, man, if I don't play well, maybe Coach Frost is going to get fired. Or if we're not doing things well, my head coach might not have a job. You know, so there's all these like outlying things that could have put pressure on players that I think now they're hopefully going to be able to play a little bit more free, right? Like, hey, that's moved on. We moved on from that. Let's just go out there and let's just play. Let's just do our thing. And so I hope to see a little bit more lax in that regard, maybe not so much fear of failure because something bad might happen and just be able to go out and just play free. Um, but the other thing is on the defensive side of the ball, we got to find a way to get to the quarterback. You know, I watched so much college football this weekend and the teams that were having wild success were the teams that were pressuring the quarterback. And the same thing in the NFL. I mean, look at what the Dolphins did to the Bills, right? How do you stop the Bills? So you get to Josh Allen's feet, and they did it a lot. And that's one thing we just have not done is be able to get to the quarterback and affect his throwing. So that's the thing on defense. And then on offense, protect the quarterback. You know, I, it, it goes back and forth. You've got to be able to protect the guy. Casey Thompson is getting beat up back there, and he's not going to be able to survive an entire season taking hits the way he has the last couple of weeks, especially against Oklahoma. And he got beat up pretty good. So protecting the quarterback, getting to the quarterback, or where I would start if I was the head coach of this football team, because if you can't do either one of those, you're not going to have give yourself a good chance to win a lot of football games. I also think, too, something needed to be addressed. And again, I don't know because I've never been in a football locker room or, or practicing football, but I mean, I have played sports, but I, a lot of it, I think, needed to be addressed mentally up here, up top, because, you know, we've talked a lot about this. I've told you, you know, what I've seen and witnessed on the sideline and just, you know, sometimes the lack of confidence and then just the lack of being defeated or sorry, just the um looking like they're defeated at times when things don't go right, not responding a lot of times to adversity. I just think, you know, however you can, maybe try to get some confidence back in this team too, I think is really going to be needed. Yeah. I mean, confidence comes with winning, mm, yeah. you know, and that, and, and it comes from not just winning the game. It comes from winning one-on-one -on -one matchups. It comes from winning the series. It comes from winning the quarter, winning the half, right? I mean, winning comes in so many shapes and sizes throughout the course of a football game. There's the games within the game. And I talk about this all the time, right? It's your individual matchup versus that player across from you. It's the offense versus the defense. It's the special teams versus the special teams and, and, and so forth. And so building confidence doesn't mean just winning the game. That's the ultimate goal. Building confidence is winning the first quarter or winning the first drive. And I'd like to see this team be able to stack wins on top of each other, right? The first drive against Oklahoma was great. And then it all went off the rails, right? Like start stacking good things within the game to build confidence throughout the game so that you give yourself a chance to win the big game at the end of it. Well, you had just talked about protecting the quarterback and a new depth chart was released, of course. You know, we had talked about it going into the Oklahoma game. I had said, I did a report on Teddy Prohaska that he had gone into the medical tent, didn't come back and play the rest of the Georgia Southern game. He had on a, a sling on his arm. He came back out not, not in uniform, so they had moved Turner Corcoran over to left tackle. Kevin Williams started the game at left guard, but now on the depth chart released today, Ethan Piper is uh, listed as the number one guy there at left guard. So I guess just that movement on the line, which we had talked about could potentially be an issue for this team. Um, what? How do you attack that and getting guys feeling good in these spots moving around like, like they're doing right now? Yeah, it's not easy by any means. And we talked about it during fall camp, like this, depth on this O-line was already really thin, you know, so moving Turner out to left tackle is a tough ask for him because you've been practicing at guard the whole time who actually played tackle last year. So he's been switching out. It's kind of like a, well, we know you could do it, so go do it. And so that's a lot to ask of him. I expect him to struggle a little bit more before he excels, just settling his feet back in. Ethan Piper's got a lot of playing experience. He started a few games last year. I think he's been working more at center. So a little bit of a transition to guard. I thought Kevin Williams played pretty well in the Georgia Southern game when he came in and played left tackle. So I'd personally like to see a little bit more of him. You know, um, Henry Lutovsky's a guy, too, who's been playing well. But you just 
it's going to be a little bit of rotation, I think. I think we're going to be trying to figure out who fits in to plug this, not necessarily the most talented five, but the best five. And I think they're still trying to figure that out. The bye week hopefully helped with that. You know, if Ethan Piper came out had a great bye week practice, he earned that starting spot. But unless someone grabbed that thing by the horns and took the starting left guard spot, I think you might see some rotation in there until someone really runs away with it. Valentino's has been a Nebraska tradition since 1957. Get the big red double jumbo deal. Two one-topping jumbo pizzas for only $18.29 each. All right, well, again, uh, also on the injury front, A.J. Allen done for the season. Our guy, we we have been talking mm. about him all throughout fall camp. We saw just some great flashes from him throughout these first four games, but he is uh, done for the season, but is going to get to redshirt because he just played in those four games. And so Gabe Irvin came into the game against Oklahoma, did some nice things, and we saw some uh, good things from him last year. I just think, you know, it just takes a while to get back into completely being in game shape coming off an ACL. So um, I guess uh, thoughts on replacing A.J. Allen. I mean, that was a deep running back room that we've been talking about as well, uh, dating back even to the spring with Anthony Grant and being added A.J. Allen. And now uh, Gabe Irvin looks to probably be the guy that's going to be filling in that AJ role. You know, that's that's the nice thing about having a room that's got a lot of depth. You know, it's you no one's going to complain about having too much depth and we can have a lot of people that were contributors. That's very helpful. First of all, I'm extremely thankful he gets a red shirt. Mm -hmm. That's a huge win for Nebraska. You know, if we would have th it happened to Teddy Prohaska last year where we burned his shirt by one game and then he loses that entire year. So he's going to gain that year back with a medical red shirt most likely this year. Um, you know, but having AJ Allen be able to redshirt's a blessing in disguise. I know we wanted him to play this year, but having him be able to sit and get healthy is huge. But I'm excited to see what Gabe Irving can do. You know, he's a guy that last year flashed a lot, but again, the injury. So how does he come back? I think sometimes all guys need is an opportunity to just really get back out there. So I think Gabe Irving's going to have that opportunity with Grant and try and get this running game going and try and rely a little bit more on this running game so that the issue of protecting the passer with new offensive linemen doesn't rear its ugly head as much if you can just grind it out on the ground. So Keith Mann had this in his game notes. Trey Palmer has uh, 28 receptions through four games and had his first touchdown against Oklahoma. And 28 catches is the most ever by a Nebraska player through four games. And we've been talking about him, and he certainly had some big catches. But I still don't think he's really been um, – had a – huge breakout game yet and so you, you look at those numbers and some of the things he's been able to do and I don't even think we've seen e anywhere close to the best of Trey Palmer yet yeah you know you see the you see the opportunities that he has and you see the potential really and what he can be and so that's a guy that you just have to keep plugging you know eventually he's going to blow the top off a of defense and I think the thing that has impressed me a little bit is his ability for the the yards after catch you know, he hasn't had really the opportunity, and I think that's what you're alluding to, to really get the ball on a slant and take it to the house. You know, he has that type of speed and that type of explosive, explosiveness. So I'd like to see more short passing game to him and let him really run with the ball in his hands. And uh, another guy I'd like to see some more get going is Omar Manning. He's a guy that we really need to get going. You know, a big-bodied receiver like that that can go over the middle, make contested catches, 50-50 balls. That's a guy that I'd be looking to to see if he can step up a little bit as well. Could potentially be a game that uh, this offense could really have a breakout game by some receivers because Indiana has not been very good against the pass. In fact, defensively, overall, statistically, uh, you know, if you look at the Big Ten statistics, Nebraska is at the bottom at the uh, last place. I I'm, it's just what it is. I mean, you can look at that's the numbers. Yeah, and that's, then that's, that's, that's just a fact. Second to last is Indiana, and they gave up uh, mm. 354 passing yards to Cincinnati, 329 passing yards to Western Kentucky. And so this very well could be a, a breakout game for Casey and some of these wide receivers. I think it's a good matchup for them. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, I think that this is a team that, <clears throat> honestly, if you're looking at Nebraska, the strength of our team, I would have to say, is our offense. So, you know, you talk about strength against their weakness. You want to make sure you go out there and spread the ball around and really blow the top off this thing. And honestly, it is what it is. We're going to have to try and score 30 to win most games. So, you know, if this is a team that I think if the offense can embody that mentality and embody the idea that, like, hey, it's a race to 30, you know, and go out there and find a way to make that happen – then we'll be okay. And I think this offense has the playmakers and it has the people in the positions to do it. A lot of it's going to depend on the offensive line, which I will keep saying, 
but it has the ability to go out and score 30 every time. So I'm excited to see what they can do and get back out there and see if there's any new wrinkles thrown into this offense, too, that maybe Mickey Joseph and Mark Whipple have installed over the bye week. That being said, though, I mean, and, and that was one thing that Mickey Joseph talked about after the Oklahoma game is that he wished he would have slowed things down a little bit and limited more of the possessions for Oklahoma. Indiana plays very, very fast, and they score fast when they can. So how do you go about – uh, balancing that when Indiana plays fast, I mean, is it just going to be uh, you know fast, 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 or do you do you expect Nebraska maybe to potentially try to do what Mickey Joseph was alluding to with Oklahoma, maybe try to slow things down a little bit and um, keep the offense on the field a little bit longer? I mean, the way you do that is by running the football, mm -hmm. you know. And so, if you want to go out there and, r and establish a run and control the tempo of the game, then yes, that's what you would like to do. Now, that being said, I don't know if this offense is built to do that. I mean, you've seen it. We have the ability to run the football, but I don't know if this is an offense that's like, hey, let's huddle up like a Minnesota, right? Let's stand at the line for 40 seconds and kill some clock. I feel like we would just kind of get clunky in the rhythm we have. That's just not the rhythm that this offense has been in. That being said, we might need to. You know, this is a thing where going three and out and burning 45 seconds off the clock cannot happen against a team like Indiana because your defense will just get wore out. I think I was just watching Indiana. They have a left tackle, Luke Haggard, who's an extremely good player. Um, and I think they ran 106 plays last week, mm -hmm. you know, they so did. they run a lot of plays and they can wear down a defense with just how much like volume there is. So yeah, Mickey's right. We do need to control the clock a little bit, but the way you do that is by running the football. So I'd like to see us establish the run with Grant, with Gabe Irvin, with whoever it is, maybe a little quarterback run with Casey and just try and grind out a little bit more clock and play a little bit of the field position game too. What other things as a, you know, for an offensive line that, uh, you know, lost your starting left tackle, moving things around, what are some other things that can be done to help out that offensive line as they work through some things? You know, the, the, the keeping the passing game on rhythm is really important. Um, keeping Casey Thompson, those receivers on the short passing game and keeping them on, on pace is important. But, you know, the biggest thing is just if you can control the run game, it slows down the pass rush. You know, when you get back there and you throw the ball 60, 65 times a game, these, that's what these DNs want. That's what these DNs live for. They love for the sack and the sack dances and the pound my chest and show my grill and do all that fun stuff. They don't love when the offensive tackle and guard double team them for 40 times a game and push them back and push them back and body blow and body blow and body blow. And then also now it's time to pass rush They're a little bit more beat up. There's a little less air in that you know, a little less gas in the tank. So I think that as a young offensive line and with new guys, you want to really rely on the run game to really try and take some pressure off the pass game. But that requires getting a lead. So it, it's catch 22. You know, there's really no way to hide. You can't hide out there. If you're a young offensive lineman or you're in a new spot, I mean, it's league play, baby. There, there is no more hiding. It's time to get after it. You know, you just said this, and you talked about this before, about as a defense, it's not necessarily what you want to hear. Like, oh, we just got to go out, score everybody. So what do you want to see what uh, i guess can be done by this nebraska defense against this indiana offense you know they're gonna throw the ball over the yard so i think that we've played a lot of shell coverage a little softer coverage than i'd like to see over these last few weeks and i don't know if that was a combination of chenander not feeling comfortable of getting to the quarterback so he's having to send blitzes which then requires us to play a little softer in zone or you know if that was just kind of the play call but i would like to see these dbs get up in these receivers face and challenge them you know, I want to see a little bit more challenge on the line of scrimmage, a little jam, a little man coverage. Put some of these guys on islands and say, hey, Tommy Hill, go earn that. You know, hey, Quentin Newsom, go after there and get in these guys' faces and get after them. And then when you play tight coverage, maybe it makes the quarterback hold that ball for just another half a second so he's not in rhythm. And then maybe Garrett Nelson and Caleb Tanner and those guys can actually get to the quarterback if it's not just ball in, ball out, ball in, ball out, which is what we've seen a lot of teams do with the quick passing game against us. So... I'd like to see some tighter coverage on the front, on the back end, and then maybe that allows just that half second longer needed to get those rushers to the quarterback. Okay, so your three big keys for Nebraska to win this one against Indiana. You know, the first one is just no turnovers. You know, I think that we can't turn the football over. When you're a football team that's kind of trying to find a way to stop the bleeding, right? I mean, right now we're just bleeding everywhere right now. The number one thing you got to do is take care of the football. So take care of the football on offense. Don't give Indiana any short fields. Don't let them steal any possessions and go down there. You just take care of the football. It's okay to punt. It's okay to punt and flip the field. You know, get one or two first downs and flip the field is so much better than trying to force something on a third and seven or a third and eight and throwing a bad pick or just ball security is super important. You know, the second thing is establishing a run. 
you know, I think establishing the the run with Grant and those and Irvin and those guys early in the football game to try and, like you said, control some of the clock is going to be really important. And then on defense, I think the big thing is get sacks. You know, we've talked about it all episode, but these are really important things that if you watch college football around, these are what people are winning football teams are doing. They're taking the ball away, they're establishing a run, and they're sacking the opponent's quarterback. Like those are, that's a really good recipe to win football games. So, you know, I loved that we have kind of limited our penalties. We've limited some of that stuff. Now it's just trying to put it all together. So if we can do those three things, we give ourselves a really good chance against an Indiana team that's not very good. They're struggling as much as we are. So, but this is a team that if you let them get rolling and scoring points, then they get the confidence and they will just throw the ball over the yard if they can. All right. So players to watch for this week. Who you got? Offense, defense. I mean, Ethan Piper, you know, the, the guy, if he's going to get a start at left guard, you got to watch and see how he's going to do um up there up front and then also just that whole position who keeps rotating in or who's playing in the left guard spot throughout's going to be a, a big position and then you know i'm really going to watch tommy hill and quentin newsom i want to watch these two corners and see how they respond to chenander being let go and how they respond to if there's any different coverage those two guys can make or break this game with how well and how tight they can get up there and play the ball i'm gonna throw isaac gifford in there too a little bit and see if maybe he can get up there and press some of these guys from that hybrid role too. So the back ends where I'm looking on the defense, the offensive line obviously is where I'm looking on the offense, but those are two big positions to see if we can come out with a W this weekend. All right. Well, you've watched, uh, you just said it, you watched a lot of college football this weekend. You've now got a few uh, weeks in to watch. How do you, um, I guess, break down the Big Ten so far? Row the boat. Gophers <laughs> are looking good. I mean, that's that's the number one takeaway from the Big Ten West right now is you know, Wisconsin's kind of ailing all over the place who you thought Iowa doesn't. <laughs> I've seen high school quarterbacks throw it better than whatever Petrus is doing over there. And that defense is really good, but that offense is just not good at all. Yeah. You know, and then we're struggling. So, I mean, the Big Ten West, I think, is the Gophers to lose um, and put it that way. And then you put you flip it over the other side. And, I mean, it's astounding how easily Ohio State can score points mm -hmm. like you watch them and you're just like oh my gosh it is just absolutely astounding how quickly they score points you know so that's been something you know um I'm gonna say it I watched the Oklahoma Kansas State game yeah. I am extremely happy for Adrian Martinez Same. I think that he played his tail off that whole K, K State might win the Big 12 yeah. They have a really salty squad. If Adrian can play at the same level that he's playing at, they might win the Big 12. So, you know, I, I love college football. It's my favorite. My wife's the big NFL fan. I watch it because I have clients. But, I mean, it's just been really fun to turn on football games on Saturday and see them go to the wire. How's her fantasy team doing? Not great. Her <laughs> team is not great. You know, they are really struggling. I think she renamed her team Team Trash. So <laughs> she's got she's to do some managing over there and get their players going. No, I did. I actually was going to ask you about the Oklahoma Kansas State game because I called that. I knew that Adrian would have a big day against Oklahoma. Say what you will about Brent Venables. I know he's a great defensive mind, but it's still the same players that they've had for years. A lot of them that have had trouble with a running quarterback. And so um, Adrian played really well. He had said that, that he felt like he let the program down uh, last week and they in the loss to Toledo. And so, um, you know, I, I think Husker Nation appreciates everything that Adrian did here. And mm -hmm. um, maybe he was trying to go hand one back to Oklahoma for what they did here in Lincoln a week oh, ago. There, there's no <laughs> doubt. You know, he and he remembers that game there last year. Yeah. You know, where he and uh, so, yeah, he came out there. But I think that Kansas State with Deuce Vaughn and Adrian Martinez and that running attack that they have and they have a first or second round pass rusher there. They've got some key pieces that when Kansas State can stay together. You know, they can really make a run at this thing. And and two, how much is that for Adrian? I think he's probably going to have success against a lot of Big 12 teams and you know, yeah, they don't it, play defense. Well, and, it, and he just came from such a physical league. He very well could really have a massive year. No, for the, the Big 12 doesn't play defense. <laughs> it's a race to 60. That's all they do. It's all Baylor it is. Baylor plays That's a little bit of defense. Be. Who? Baylor. No, they don't. Oh, okay. No one in the Big 12 plays defense. All None right. of them. Well, yeah, again, I uh, did want to mention that, though, before we got out of here. All right, well, uh, we will uh, wrap this thing up, and we'll have another one for you coming up next week. You're going to be in studio soon, right? Yes, I will be in studio next week, I promise. You're going to watch an NFL game, our uh, yep. Cincinnati Huskers. Yeah, I'm going to head up to Cincinnati. Uh, I got my clients to starting left guard, Cordell Volson for the Bengals, so I'll get to see Cam Taylor-Britt, Zach Taylor, all those guys go out there and play against the Dolphins, who just laid one on the Bills, so... It should be a great game. You know, Joe Burrow and those guys finally got one in the win column, but Dolphins are Dolphins are salty. All right. Well, uh, we'll see you here in studio maybe next week. And uh, glad you guys made it back from the hunting trip.
Absolutely appreciate it. Go Big Red. All right, again, this has been the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks for listening. Family traditions mean great food. With treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations, Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition for 65 years.